Hello, everyone, and welcome to Organizational Change Management in ITSM. My name is Tabitha Ishman, and I'm the Marketing Manager of Excalibur Data Systems. So I just wanted to welcome all of you to the webinar today, and we're going to talk about a few logistics before we go ahead and get started. So if you can change the slide for me, Mike. So the, the lines are muted, um, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent via email to everyone on the line tomorrow and we'll answer questions at the end in a Q&A session. Um, but you can ask questions at any time during the presentation just by typing them in to the questions section. Um, but Mike will have some questions as we move along in the presentation as well. So you can hit next slide for me. I'm trying. Um, so just a little bit about Excalibur before we go ahead. Um, we are a leading edge consulting firm guiding organizations through the digital transformation journey by leveraging best of breed enterprise service management technologies. We help create next generation solutions to optimize and automate IT organizations and assets by delivering compelling solutions for your customers. So as you guys can see, Mike is on his webcam for you all today. So I'd like to kick us off and introduce Mike Fuson, VP and Senior Solution Architect of Excalibur Data Systems. Greetings, everyone. We're gonna have some fun here. There will be a couple of sections in the presentation where I'm gonna ask for you guys to share some of the things that you've seen out there. So we're gonna ask you when we get to that part to just raise your hand. Um, which is the little button that you can click uh, uh, down in there and Tabitha will unmute you uh, so you can maybe uh, collaborate with us. We want this to be very collaborative. So this is the first part in a series. We can't obviously cram the whole of organizational change into one hour. Um, it would be nice if we could, uh, but we're going to do this in kind of a series of parts. So this is kind of that first series, which is what is organizational behavior and what are the things that, that drive it to some degree. Um, so organizational behavior and organizational change for many of us, when you look at it from the context of an ITSM platform or an ITSM tool or an ITSM mindset, um, it's maturing our organizations into more of a serious service oriented culture. So why do we do, why, why we do what we do and why do we do it that way anyway? Um, organizational change management is complicated because swapping out the technology is easy, changing the organizational behavior, just a hair bit more difficult, hair bit more difficult, one of those fish stories. Um, so service excellence and business orientation as that relates to organizational change. So what's really going on? Uh, what are the challenges that we're facing? Uh, and it's the, con our, our consumer or, or end user expectations um, are changing very rapidly and have been for a while. Interestingly enough, I gave a similar presentation very early this year before we all were impacted by uh, COVID-19. Uh, and as all of us know, so many things have changed since March and they continue to change uh, on a in many cases on a near daily basis. Uh, we're having to adapt very, very quickly to a lot of changing facets within our businesses. Um, so faster pace is required for business delivery and desired outcomes. Uh, with the things that we deal with, you know, where you can go to Amazon and click a button and order something and a, a day or two later, depending on where you live, um, that particular item is arriving at your doorstep uh, the expectations uh, of our customers have changed as a result of that, like it or not. And so we've got to be more nimble uh, and we've got to be able to, to, to deliver things to the business uh, with the desired outcomes in a little faster manner. Um, there's an increased level of competition. Uh, I think, I, I know for most of you, you probably have never heard this term or even seen it in your organizations, but it's a little term called shadow IT. Um, we see it occasionally out there. Uh, actually, you know, I'm, I'm fibbing a little bit. We see it all the time. I'm sure many of you see it all the time where 
different business units within the organization may decide to go do their own thing. Uh, and we as IT may get pulled in once it becomes a mess uh, or get pulled in at the last moment and we're scrambling, trying to deal with something that a business unit has now decided they're gonna do and they're way down the path and we have to deal with that. And that's some of the competition that we have. If we're not nimble, if we're not fast enough, uh, the business units may go out and try to find their own solutions uh, and we're gonna end up getting stuck with a lot of times supporting a solution. And, and I'm sure some of you have seen this uh, where the solution that they decided on, we may already own or we may already have a product that does essentially the same thing uh, and they didn't need to go buy something else. Some organizations are born into this new service orientations, but others have to make a very hard transition. Um, each organization is different. Each organization has its own unique characteristics. And you know, it's, sometimes it's easier because maybe you're starting a new, so nobody knows any better. Um, sometimes things are rather ingrained and that organizational transition, that organizational change is a much more difficult thing. It's a reinvention of the how or the what uh, and the how and the what that is necessary and it's increasing in frequency. So many organizations are very ill-prepared. So let's explore why. Why are organizations ill-prepared? Uh, in many cases, there's little or no, no awareness of the actual service or organizational maturity level. We've not sat down and have that hard conversation. Where are we on a maturity scale? Where do we want to improve? There, in many cases, is a narrow work focus, and there's really no context to that. It's heads down, do what we're going to do. Bad examples being set by leadership where leadership reacts to whoever's screaming the loudest rather than what is driving the organization to be more successful. Many times there's a shallow understanding of the business purpose. Um, as I'm sure many of you are seeing as we're uh, dealing with COVID-19, a lot of this has changed somewhat for us because budgets are much tighter. Budget justifications, there's more steps to go through, and we really need to understand what the business impact and business purpose is. Uh, and this wasn't always necessarily the case. There's now a, a, an occurrence out there that's kind of forced us into starting to thinking about that. Sometimes there's no customer or end user empathy. We're gonna put this tool out there, damn the torpedoes full steam ahead. It may have not the best user interface. It may be very difficult to use, but this is the tool we've decided on, so we're gonna throw it out there anyway. Many times that's driven by limited interaction with the customers or the broader, broader business customers. Do we actually understand what they need or are we just reacting and putting something out there that we think is good without really understanding if they think it's good? The organization is not optimally organized. Me instead of we. Uh, you know, all of us have seen that sort of scenario where folks are looking at this and, and what's in it for me or how does it impact me? And it really needs to be more of a we discussion, which is what's best for the business. It may not be the greatest thing for me or may, my job may be a little bit harder, but for the business, it's actually better and going to drive us forward. Um, I always kind of tie that to, I know I've got a few folks on the line from some of our customers here, Think about making major changes to a change management process. Um, most of you haven't seen it. I've occasionally seen people throw themselves on the floor like they're two and hold their breath because we're gonna ask them to do more when, implement, when putting a change in. We're gonna ask for more information so we can better evaluate and better respond to the business, maybe prevent an outage because we've got more information or a collision, whatever the case may be. The it's just done this way. None of you have ever heard that. We do X, Y, Z just because that's the way we've always done it. Um, it's really a resistance to the necessary change in lieu of what's comfortable. We all know that change is difficult. Some of us are much more flexible than others, but not one of us, not one of us can honestly say, the change is easy. 
as the, in the human existence, changing and doing something differently is generally gives us some level of angst. So it can be very, very difficult to get change. And then there are folks that actively resist any sort of change, which makes it even more complicated. Or, and I left this for last because it's always a goodie, people just plain don't care. From an organizational standpoint, they just don't care if we need to make a change. And you know, that can really make things very, very complicated. Processes are difficult. You know, industrial model routes, plug and chug, head down, just do my thing. And many industries that, that won't go away, but rather the collective consciousness for broader business interests and customer contact will have to increase. We can still kind of plug and chug, but we've got to have a little broader outlook on what those impacts are. Legacy drivers of purpose, the why is removed or modified, but the process stayed the same. So we didn't change the process. We know we should be doing something different, but why we're doing it is different, but we just kept doing it the same way anyway. Not flex flexible enough to bend without breaking. So our process has been so over-engineered that we can't flex the process without breaking the process. And I liken this to, I hate picking on change management, but change management is one of the most complex processes from an ITIL perspective that many of us as customers have in place. And I, I look at the different ways people look at this. Well, we do you know, step one through 15. And so we're gonna implement a new system and we've got to continue to do step one through 15. Without looking at the why we're doing step one through 15, do we all need to do all 15 steps in the same order? And I had a great experience with the customer a, a little bit, a little while ago where they said no, there's you know, no sacred cows here. We're going to look at this from end to end. And one of the arguments was, well, our process as written says X. So we've got to do it that way. Well, we sat down with the auditors and the compliance folks and they said, you need to do it however the process is written. So they took the opportunity to reinvent the process, making certain things easier, making actually collecting more data than they were before, but making it better for their overall process. And they rewrote all the process documents sent them through for approvals. And when they did their audit, they passed with flying colors because the process matched the documentation. Um, and sometimes that's where I'll, I'll see we get into a sticking point. Well, the documentation says we need to do this or according to SOX, we need to do this. Uh, well, according to SOX, you have to have a separation of duties and that's where the SOX requirement ends. What you've done to comply with that may be a little bit different or may have been interpreted differently. The technology, sometimes we're lagging. There's a narrow IT strategy um, and delivery of that strategy. No real understanding of the business validity of tech. So are the tools and things that we're putting into place, do they actually make sense to the business as a whole? Or are they tools for tools sake? Focusing, the focus remains on shiny objects. Um, somebody who has those decision-making Powers went to a seminar uh, you know, or, or really an online webinar in today's world. But you know, think back to you know, a year ago, they might have gone to uh, an event or, or a, a CIO event or an industry event, and they got really excited about something new, shiny, um, and that's captured all of their focus. And we haven't started to break that down to look at what are the drivers what's the complexity to get this into the environment, and then what sort of organizational change is gonna be required in order to really get the full value out of whatever decision's been made. Lack of organized understanding of technology and service enablement. So we haven't aligned our technology to the services that we're trying to deliver. Um, I think to a meeting I had with a, a customer when we were allowed to actually run around, um, it was late last year, uh, and their CIO asked a very interesting question. Why do we have eight different discovery tools? We have got all these agents that are running on everybody's machine and they all seem to be doing discovery. Are, do we have, to, can we consolidate some tools? Do we actually need all of these? And there were some, it was a very good discussion because we picked apart what each of the actual tools does. 
And there was a need for multiple tools because not one tool was able to do all of the things they needed it to do. But when we started to look at it, there was duplication of effort. And one team had put in one tool to do X, another team put in another tool to do Y, and X and Y weren't all that different. But nobody knew that we were collecting more or less the same information. And all of a sudden, we have all these different things that we're now managing. Um, well, what is that helping us from a service delivery perspective? What's our longer term focus on the services that we're trying to deliver? Are we trying to become more proactive um, or, and become less reactive? Uh, is it just so we know what's going on? It's looking at all of those things and understanding how those are going to impact us. This all starts to drive what the to understand what the organizational change is that's going to be required to really get where we want to go. And as we talked about in an earlier slide, it could be we're not too far off um, and the organizational change isn't going to be dramatic or it could be a dramatic shift for everybody. Um, and that's going to require a better management of the organizational change. So as a result of some of these things, there's a continuous low level of maturity um, and, uh, and there's little inspiration uh, or Perhaps there's a perception that we don't need to grow into other things. Um, we're not always looking forward. Tendency to accumulate a, a, a lackadaisical approach or just a please let me do my thing mindset. You know, we just want to be able to keep our heads down and we don't want to be bothered by all of these changes that we're trying to do. Slow or no adoption of business needs, not understanding what the business actually needs of us. The organization loses its edge and can hurt some parts of their reputation. And ultimately there's a resistance, uh, a resistance develops to what the organization needs from its services, its systems, its processes, and its people. Um, because we're not effectively managing the organizational change required to get folks on the train um, to help us start to drive the changes that are necessary. Uh, one example that I kind of use uh, as a major shift in organizational change, and especially when we start to think about COVID. So come March for all of us, or almost probably almost all of us, if not all of us, everybody started to have to work from home. So there's a, a massive shift to being able to allow people to work from home. Well, one of the challenges in working from home is there's a lot of moving parts. Did we take a look and see if we had proper knowledge in place? And maybe we, we don't have knowledge that's published out to our customers. Well, could that be a really good thing to have out there to help limit the amount of impact and the amount of angst that people are feeling where they can go? And here's an article of how you set your cell phone up to um, get corporate email or um, how, you're, how you're able to connect via the VPN from your home computer. Or if you're using your home computer, you first need to install um, the antivirus product used by the organization or whatever it may be. Um, there's now an opportunity to maybe do knowledge better, but maybe we've not been doing knowledge real very well because as an organization, it just hasn't been something we wanted to do or that please just let me do my thing. I don't want to have to create knowledge. And we want to do a major shift into more of a knowledge centered service or KCS approach. That's going to require a very large organizational shift and a large understanding of what are the things that we need to do in order to effectively manage that change that has to occur in our thought, our processes, our technology, in order to deliver a better set of knowledge. Um, and you know, thereby, you know, that whole shift left thing you try to do with KCS, and this isn't a KCS webinar, we're doing one of those later that you can join us for to get into the depths of KCS, but we're now shifting our thinking, shifting how we're doing things. And what does the organization need from us in order for the services, systems, process, and people to be where they need to be to do that in an effective way? Not just in a, eh, we kind of did okay. How do we get people's hearts and minds changed that, that this is a good thing and that we can drive this forward? So one of our first little exercises I like to do is let's talk about an organization you've interacted with that's not doing these things well. So an example of a business or personal interaction with an organization that did not impress you when you engaged 
or appeared to have handled change poorly. Um, you know, what was the end result? How do, how do they behave? And then, you know, what does that make you think about what the culture may be like, how they may be organized, um, how their people think and act? Um, there's a lot of elements that go into successful change. And I think about um, how where I've gone out there, um, I had to make a business trip, you know, uh, um, uh, um, amongst the, the, the COVID fund that was going on. Um, and it was very, very different how my hotel was providing things. Now, you know, I, for uh, up until March of this year, pretty much lived in hotels for about the last 14 years, you know, anywhere from 120 to 160 nights a year, pretty typically. And you know, I've got a brand allegiance. Uh, and with that particular brand, there were changes that had to be made for COVID. And in my first trip, the hotel was very communicative with me about what was going to be different. There was no hot breakfast anymore. They weren't going to turn the room for the week that I was there. Um, if I needed anything, I just needed to ask. The pool was closed. The fitness room was closed. I knew what was happening when I walked in. Now, my second stay, which was at another brand, because that was what was available in the location, didn't communicate any of that. And when I arrived, having had the first experience, I asked the questions to understand what the parameters are. Now, what was my result in that? The first brand, which is a ma very major brand that everybody knows, um, they, uh, um, I thought, handled the, the change very, very well. It wasn't ideal. It wasn't an ideal situation. But there's a lot of things that were beyond their control. But they communicated to me what those differences were going to be. In fact, I received an email before I even, like a week before I even got out there. Hey, just to let you know, here's what, you know, here's some differences that you're going to see from what you're probably used to. Uh, then when I got there, they had signs up. They covered all of it during check-in to make sure that all of my questions were answered um, and, you know, no information was lost. So I felt pretty good about it. I understood, you know, with COVID, okay, can't have a breakfast bar. Um, in fact, you know, some of our favorite buffet restaurants we may have, will they ever be able to reopen? Um, you know, there, there are things that are unknowns right now, and they were doing the best that they could to make sure I stayed safe and to make sure that their staff stayed safe. In the second instance, it just didn't go very well. Um, they weren't sure on a couple of the questions I, were ask, I was asking. We've had a major change uh, for all of us in how we do things. Um, so, you know, I came away from that going, wow, all right. Is it the brand that's a problem? Is it just this particular hotel? Those are the questions that ran through my mind. Um, and I thought, you know, geez, you know, is the training really where it needs to be? Do they understand what, what needs to happen and how to communicate that to me, the customer? So that's an example that I saw recently of somebody not handling the change real well. I'd love to hear other examples that you may, you may have seen where organizations may not be engaging with you in a, a manner that you think is very good. We're gonna give everybody a second. Just raise your hand um, if you have some thoughts and Tabitha will open the line for you and we'll let you chat with us. Well, I thought for sure I'd see Rob Knox's hand go up, without a doubt. All right, so the, you know, the other exercise, and, and you can feel free to respond to either one, is who is doing this well. So I gave you the example of the organization that was doing it well uh, from a quality standpoint, and the organization was doing the same thing but not doing it so well. Um, one of the things that's difficult is you, know, you walk away with a certain impression. So if we equate that to our businesses, um, if we're not handling things very, very well, you know, they're going to form an impression of, say, the IT department or the department that we may work in. There's going to be an impression formed by that individual. And that individual talks to other individuals. Uh, and if we haven't handled the necessary change very well, uh, and we're not you know, impressive to them. They hate to kind of put it that way, but you want to be able to put your best face on. Um, they're 
going to come away with a with a bad impression, um, and they're not going to be as comfortable interacting with us as we'd like. Um, I think of an organization that also does this well. This is an example, kind of in the pre-COVID days. Um, many of you may have worked with like a Jabra or a Plantronics. I think they're both very good companies. Um, but I think back to when the first little Bluetooth headsets came in that kind of sat over your ear and had the little thing that stuck off of it. Some of the first ones had a little foam cover that went on the actual, to cut the wind, went on the actual end of it. And, and uh, I had one of the little headsets and I lost my first foam cover very, very quickly to come in the package uh, with it. And so I, I put the other one on and I kept that one for quite a while. Um, and then it vanished at some point. And so I went to look to see, can I buy these little foam covers? Well, couldn't find them. They're, they're part of a kit that had all kinds of other stuff I didn't need. Um, so I called the manufacturer and said, hey guys, do you offer these separately? Now, the, the, you know, the, this, was a, this was a brand new product. The organization had to react to being able to service this new product. They had a great customer service interaction where they said, well, unfortunately, no, we don't sell those separately. Um, however, we've got some here. Do you mind if I mail you some? No, that would be great. What will that cost? Oh, we'll, we'll mail them out free of charge. Great. I really appreciate that, right? Didn't think much of it. They confirmed my address. I got a little package in the mail. Wouldn't you know it? It was two of those little kits that I could buy online. So now I had four more little covers for my little Bluetooth uh, earpiece. That was pretty impressive to me. They understood that they weren't quite where they needed to be in the, the parts area, but they were able to solve my problem, gave me something I would have paid for, probably didn't cost very much uh, from their perspective. I walked away as a pretty happy customer. And I tell, tell anybody they'll ask, if you're gonna buy headsets or Bluetooth things, um, you know, look at Jabra and, uh, and the folks at Plantronics first. They both have ACE customer service. Um, and so when you start to look at that, you know, it impressed me. Um, they, they behaved in a very positive way. My, the end result was, was success. And so their culture must be very empowered, right? That rep didn't need to go get permission from a supervisor to do something. They were able to take it up on, their, on, on themselves and do something very, very small in the big scheme of things, but that was a big deal to me. This, well, I want to kind of pause for a moment and give everyone the opportunity if they uh, have an example of an experience like that where they've seen things go in a very positive manner. Rob Knox, of course. Yay, Rob! I have to uh, I have to go ahead and answer you right. So uh, I actually worked with uh, American DJ company. They they do uh, multiple uh, you know, kind of multiple brands, but one of the brands that they had was recently acquired, and uh, I needed some parts. And uh, they bent over backwards to find parts that would work for me. Uh, called me back several times, and then they actually just shipped the stuff out free of charge, uh, even though the the time that had elapsed with the uh, warranty service had, had already elapsed. It was only by a few months, but they, they they just went ahead and said, you know what, we're just, you know, since we know these parts were hard to find, we're just going to send these out for you. Well, and there you go, right? So an acquisition had occurred. There was all kinds of changes, but they worked hard to make that the changes they were experiencing not super impactful on you. So they had ways in which to deal with that. That's a great story, Rob. I appreciate that. So when we start to look at your organization, right? So Tabitha is going to throw up a couple of polls here. So what is the current temperature of your customer end user relationship? And so we've got uh, Tabitha, uh, if you'll throw up that first um, poll. I think it's up, isn't it? Yeah, it's up. Yep. So, you know, is it good? Is it so, so, you know, it needs some work. 
we'll give everybody a moment here to answer and Tabitha will close the poll out and then we're gonna have a second one for you on this next question. So it right, looks like mostly um, so so. Yep. Did you did you share that out? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, mostly so so, right? So you know, part of the organizational change and aligning with a, a good service delivery culture is how do we take that from so so to good? Because most of you, you know. Or, uh, if I do my math real quick here, 82% are in the so-so needs some work category. Right, only 18% of you said, "Hey, it's good." Um, you know, so how do we improve that, right? And organizational change has that impact. So our second qu poll question is: rating your overall IT organizational maturity level from a, a one being an ad hoc to a five. It works as a well-oiled business machine. We'll leave that up there for about 10 more seconds. And I can see the numbers as you guys are answering, and it's pretty typical to what we see at most organizations today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the results. So nine, full 90% of you said, hey, we're getting it done, but not all that well organized. Um, or, you know, we're down headed, you know, we're, we're just a little bit better than just ad hoc. And that's actually pretty normal. Um, the organization has to embrace the changes that are ahead of us and, and, and uh, organ be able to organize themselves to deal with the change that's out there. Uh, one example would be putting out a customer portal. And I know that there's a, a few of you on the line that we've had this conversation with. Um, we, we talk to customers about putting the customer portal out, building the portal and the user interface and you know, thinking about all, all of the things we wanna have out there and how it looks and how it flows and the colors. And you know, that's all part of kind of a design conversation. Um, but one of the other concepts of the organizational change is we're putting a portal out there for our customers to consume. Are we communicating that this is happening well enough to our end customers? Do they even know we're doing this? Or do we throw it out there and go, oh, here's the customer portal. Isn't this great? Right? They don't know the, the why. You know, why is this out there? What can they do with it? You know, any reasons for them to go take a look at a customer portal? Uh, and that, that's a big organizational shift to moving to a portal or you're moving from a portal where you have a single question that's being asked. You know, what can we help you with today? Type in here and it comes in as a generic thing and you know, the service desk figures it out to going to more of a service catalog driven portal where they're telling you what they need and you may be collecting you know, in the sharewall vernacular specifics forms uh, or in other systems vernacular those details related to the specific request that may be asked. You know, if they're asking for uh, toner cartridges, you're asking, well, okay, what kind of printer is it? Do you need color cartridges? Do you need black and white cartridges? You know, what are the things that we need to deliver to you? Um, we see this get rolled out there and customers are like, well, I don't wanna fill out a bunch of stuff. Customers we've seen that have been able to manage that organizational change effectively have done, and there was one, that's a global customer. I was over in one of their overseas locations. Many of you know Jeff Jones from our team was actually at their location here in the US. We were doing a follow the sun, 12 hour days, handing off to each other. And uh, well prior to their go live, when I walked into their location uh, overseas, um, the cool thing was there were these huge posters of pictures of their portal. And I got a chance to talk to a lot of the, oh yeah, we've had a, a couple of like little parties where we talked about the portal that's coming. All of us are really kind of excited about it because you know right now it's very difficult to find out the status of your ticket to not have to call would be fantastic. Well, what's one of the number one top five calls to a service desk? Status check on something they put in. Their employees were excited about being able to shift. 
Well, a lot of that was managing the organizational change, not a, oh, you know, you're going to have, we're going to, you can go see that in the portal. They had communicated it very, very well and managed, and everybody was excited to be able to now go take a look. And they had, uh, they have posters of it, and it was just really, really cool. But that was the communication part of managing the organizational change. The internal team understood the why we're doing this. The customers understood the why we're doing this. We're not gonna tell you you can't call in to get an update because all of us probably can name by name individuals in our organization that with a gun to their head and the, you know they're on their, if they pick up the phone, they may not, may, you know, they may not survive, um, you know, making it through that phone call to check status will still pick up the phone and dial the service desk number. They're gonna hold on like grim death. But a lot of other folks are willing to try the new alternative because we've given them a why. They can go out there anytime they want, check status, send a note over um, to the person working on it, all of those sort of things. Um, and so they were, you know, we had a large group of, you know, large organization where folks were actually pretty excited to see what they'd be able to do with the portal. And they've been able to evolve it from there because there was a lot of support. The internal team understood what was going to happen. So you start talking about the pluses and minuses um, of you know that sort of change initiative. You know, it's not we're not talking about change request here, we're talking about the organizational change. So have any of you experienced a recent or need for an organizational shift or organizational change and some things that maybe went well, some things that maybe didn't go so well that you might be willing to share? All you have to do is raise your hand in there and we'll call on you. I can give you an example. No one really wants to share. Okay, so earlier I talked a little bit about the client that rewrote their process document to match the new process they were going to have for their change, you know, their 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 IT change management or change request process. What was really really cool about that is as they were evolving that process, they did a weekly newsletter to the team because there was a lot of angst because they were getting rid of their current tool, which was super simple super easy, but didn't provide a lot of value to IT. You could track a ticket in it, but you know, getting any meaningful reporting out of it wasn't all that great. And they were moving to ShareWell as a new ITSM platform. Um, they wanted to get a lot out of it, get a lot of power, but not overburden their users. Um, but they knew change management was gonna be very different from the way they did it today because they had cobbled something together that would fit in the tool that they had today. And what we saw come out of that was they were doing a weekly uh, newsletter that was talking about some of the changes that were coming, explaining the whys to the folks that were going to consume it. When we got to training, the, I didn't see a bunch of eyeballs in the room where they were filled with angst or vitriol for this being changed. They had a pretty good idea of the changes being made and the whys. Um, there were some questions that came into training, um, but uh, it wasn't like uh, I we typically see where we deploy this new change management process and we have to have the process owners in the room and other process experts from the client in the room because somebody's going to start rapid firing questions. Well, why are we doing it this way? Why are we doing it that way? They had had the opportunity to share with the team and there were some questions that came up from those newsletters and we actually had a chance to sit down with some of those folks talk through it and they understood why we were doing it but number of ideas were actually really good that made the process even better um, and so people were pulled into that um, and you know those are it was it was changing the game there we've seen the other side of that where the change is, the change is just put in whatever the new process is, it's just put in and everybody's given a document that says, here's the new SOP, deal with it. And I think many of you have been through that and know what the general outcome of, of that is. It's a long, hard slog to get good adoption because people are resisting that change. 
or they didn't agree with it, or they weren't allowed to give any input. So angles of attack, right? We have the process angle of attack. We're reevaluating what is what, what has predominant business value and shape the how we're gonna do that to those things. So we're looking at this the other way, not the here's what the tool does, so how do we fit that into the business? We're looking at what are the things that the business needs from us and then how are we gonna deliver on some of those things? And sometimes there's a little bit of give and take there, but we're looking at it from a particular viewpoint in managing the overall change. We're looking at trying to shed anything you can't fully support from a service perspective. So sometimes we overcomplicate a process, like is the politically correct way to put that. Um, and we're not gonna be able to fully support that. So all of a sudden we start backing off on things. Um, I see it a lot of times in, you know, not picking on the poor change management process, but in change management, they put something pretty robust in there. That's a more mature process that the organization isn't ready to consume. And so very, very quickly, we're backing off on features of that process. Well, let's understand what we fully, fully can stand behind and fully support, and let's do that first, because we can always, through continual service improvement, start to improve things. And again, managing that continual service improvement change with good communications. We need to create, and it's funny, because change management, this is where these two things get muddled together, right? We're, we're creating a change management strategy. This is really around organizational change management, how you're going to deal when the needs demand it. So something changes in the business and COVID is a good example of that. There's a flip. If we have a plan for how we're going to handle the or, an organizational change, we've got kind of a map. We know how to get from point A to point B and we've got to fill in some stuff. So one of our strategies is communication. Another of our strategies is we're gonna build out some additional knowledge. Another strategy is this, and we can employ those strategies because all of a sudden something has changed or evolved within the business and now the need demands that we're able to more readily, uh, readily respond to that. Angles of attack when it relates to technology. So we, we ensure a, a defined and well thought out service lines. So that is what you provide to the organization that has value. We met with a customer uh, actually yesterday who's going through a process of redefining their service catalog. And they took the most important first step, which was what are the services that we really provide to the organization? And be able to define them. Who owns the service? all of the things that are on the service screen, you know, in any of your ITSM systems, you know, it's not just the name of the service, but what are some of the other things? Can we define that stuff out? This is the things that take time. That's an organizational shift into aligning your services to that which is being delivered to the business that provide the value to the business. We call on the technology to support and help processes we're best suited but we stop seeking out the fully autonomous state for everything. If we could immediately stop doing that, in many cases, we'd be better off. We're always looking for the better mousetrap. Uh, you know, we're talking with numerous customers right now about AI ops, so artificial intelligence operations. Um, AI ops requires that you have a reasonably well thought out uh, CMDB, that you have other things in place that will allow you to really start to take advantage of some of the AI ops capacity. So we'll have a conversation with someone about it and they'll go, well, we really need to get our CMDB in place. Okay, well, AI ops will have all this great automation, but if you don't have these other things done and reasonably well thought out, you're just throwing that out there to maybe have that tool solve a couple of specific problems rather than looking at the technology to really help best support our processes. Knowing what the techno knowing technology that's in demand, what actually helps. So perception versus reality. Um, we use KCS as an example here. Um, you know, tech, there's all kinds of technology demands. Well, we could go by this tool and it would do these things. 
okay, well, are we ready for that? Do we have the things in place to really get the most out of that tool? Or are we gonna use one little scintilla of its capabilities because we don't have some of the prerequisites where they need to be? KCS being an example, we have a lot of customers that go, we wanna go KCS. Okay, fantastic. So what is your plan? Has anybody been trained in it? Do you know what an AQI is? Do you have coaches defined? And we get the, huh? Well, KCS isn't going to work super well if you don't have some of the other processes behind it. They're not hard. They're actually very easy to put into place, but you've got to have thought through them first. So it seems like, oh, well, KCS is the buzzword. We're going to do KCS. Okay, what does that actually mean? Um, AI ops is a funny example to that too, because really what is AI ops? There's a lot of AI ops tools out there and they all do something a little bit different. Um, there is kind of a general understood definition around AI ops, but it's still fairly early, early stages of really fleshing out what does it mean to have an AI ops tool within your organization. Knowing what your technology services are worth. So what are the value that the services that are being provided how, what is the value they're being provided? Or what value do they provide to the business, right? So you're developing that value mentality. If we work hard to deliver these things well and drive value to the business, we're going to get the business to be able to support us. So I use a customer example here um, of a pathology lab at a major healthcare enterprise. It was a big article um, that was out in, uh, I forget which, uh, which venue, but they were almost a full, fully automated to handle um, volume from across the entire hospital, right? In particular, we're talking about lab samples, right? And they were powered by pneumatic tubes. Yep, you think about the bank tubes, you pull up to the teller, you put the thing in the little, the little uh, tube thingy, close it up, push the button, and it you know, gets sucked in, um, and they process it and push it back out to you, right? And that was allowing them to transfer items to the lab from all the hospital wings. Well, a number of years ago, that pneumatic tube infrastructure went down for almost two days, but the group survived and they even thrived. It was because of a number of things that they had understood when they implemented this new system. So they understood what their particular part of the process was, but they also understood the entire process from end to end. How were the samples collected? How, were they, how did they get to um, the location to be sent to the lab? How was the lab sent in the back? They understood the process from end to end. The automation was put in place so that someone didn't need to understand how all the parts and pieces worked, but it served the enterprise at a level that required, was required for them to deliver the pace and the level of patient care that they were looking to provide. The staff didn't have to learn something new to overcome the automation shutdown. They simply had to engage a known manual procedure. So they had written, when they put this new technology in place, a manual procedure that says, what happens if these tubes aren't working? And that they had to overcome now the, the lack of the transport of the lab samples. So one of the cool things that happened was the hospital executives had been part of, and they had the customers that used the lab services all as part of the team that put together these plans. So the hospital executives showed up you know, all hands on deck to help the lab turn the tide on the backlog, right? They understood their business and the importance of the service being provided as it was part of patient care. They understood that, that it would mean a lot for their team. So this is the executives understood. This is where you have that executive support to appear and ask, how can we help, right? And a lot of you are, gonna, are probably giggling on mute here rather than the dictating orders and constantly asking for status updates. Right? What, that's what usually happens, right? You're, you know, somebody's a point person for somebody up the food chain to call and say, give me an update. And you're trying to get 15 minute updates because you know how often they're going to call. And the you know, folks that are trying to fix the problem are working as fast as they can. But you know, sometimes Rome wasn't built in a day. They've got to replace a card and a server, which means there's going to take time, right? Um, in order to get that back up and running. But the executive team understood how important it was for them to be part of the solution rather than just creating more work for everybody. So they showed up and, and 
I, I, I remember the story and they had some pictures of folks. You've got executive team members with their ties tucked in. They don't have their jackets on. They've got lab coats on and they're literally pushing carts around the hospital to make sure that the level of service that the organization is looking to provide is maintained while the team is trying to fix the te technological problem is able to just focus and work on that. And they already knew it wasn't going to be fixed today. Um, and that, you know, it actually made the news. It was a well-known enterprise at the time because of the critical nature of what we're talking about here. Um, you know, I talked to some of our healthcare customers. I know we've got a couple of them on the line with us. And, you know, if the radiology system goes down and you've got a trauma center, okay, we got to have a plan B real, real quick because seconds matter or cardiac cases, seconds matter and what we're doing and the technology can fail. What's our backup plan? And, and the backup plan is not somebody asking every five minutes, well, how soon is that gonna be back up? We've enacted our backup plan. We're acting on our backup plan, letting the folks that are working on the problem have a little bit of focus and time to try to solve that problem. This is a big organizational thinking shift. If you can get your organization thinking in these terms, organizational change becomes a lot less difficult. The executives are, are helping to explain the why of a change that may be coming. The executives are supporting that change. You've engaged various teams to be able to drive that uh, change home. And you know, you know that you know, you've got support on multiple fronts. You've got customer advocates that are saying, hey, I was part of this conversation. Um, I was part and parcel to the decisions that were made. I, our, our input was heard um, and we're getting something that's there. So the point being in all of this is there was a service orientation there. They knew the value of what they provided. The business orientation is they knew the enterprise drivers around the, the technology and its criticality. There was a high level of relationship maturity between the provider and the business. So nobody panicked because they went down. Hey, they're, they're down. What are we going to do? And the backup plan was immediately put into play. High level of provider and business maturity. The business and the, 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 the group providing the service work together in a very mature way to address the situation that was at hand. Leadership set a good example, right? Uh, I, I'm one of the owners of Excalibur. Um, I never ask any of my team members to do anything I'm not willing to sit here and do myself. I'm not going to ask them to stay all night if I'm not willing to sit here and stay all night sitting right next to them. Um, that's what good leadership is going to be. So the executives with their ties tucked in, pushing around carts, said, hey, the CEO is not above making this place run. They automated a critical pieces to, to increase the efficiency, but not because they didn't understand how to perform the job, right? I'm sure you guys see this. I see this all the time. We're automating it. But do we really understand how do, how, do we, how do we perform that function? Yeah, we're going to automate it, but how does that function get performed? And you take simple things like we need to do a password reset or we need to increase the size of a mailbox. We can automate that, but the team knows how to do it manually if they have to. And then you get into more complex things and you need to be able to pick those apart and say, what is the process to, to do this particular job? So it's BRM, business relationship management, and service orientation all wrapped up into one big ball. So formalizing some of this, your service and your business orientation, two other topics that provide some structure around that are business relationship management. We've talked about knowledge-centered service. I know many of the folks that are on the phone, you have BRM teams. They're the bridge between the business and IT, um, and they're helping to kind of translate those requirements. So from a recap perspective, organizational change is very, very difficult. If you understand that and you prepare for it, you can make it happen. A commitment to, two digital trans to, to true digital transformation, and it requires adopting a what does the business need from us mentality, and then go find out what they need. That's the kind of that BRM piece. Looking at things from the customer's point of view, looking at things from the staff's point of view. All the tools in the world won't solve the problem, so don't start with the tool. Start by defining the problem and the potential solutions for it. And start 
also asking what is going to drive value. That's going to give you that digital transformation and help you understand how you need to manage the organizational change. And then take what you've learned and begin applying it to solving the needs of the business and providing value to the business. I'm going to open the floor to questions. Now I got to do is raise your hand and Tabitha will unmute you. But we are going to be doing a follow up where we're going to dive a little deeper into what are the components of successfully managing the organizational change. We need to set the stage and understanding of what are, the, are all the elements that impact organizational change and the organizational change really required to be able to manage organizational change. You're starting to, you know, stuff all starts to come together. But in order to effectively manage organizational change, we as an organization in IT have to change ourselves to a degree to be able to ask the right questions and be able to serve the business. So Tabitha, the, the, the floor is open and I'm happy to answer questions that you guys may have. Mike, maybe if you can give a couple examples of communication methods that organizations have implemented in the past that you've seen work for them. So I used the, the, the couple of examples um, around uh, um, you know, a, a newsletter or the posters and little parties. Uh, one, another method that we've seen is you know, uh, if you're doing a portal or you're rolling things out, putting a brand around it, putting a brand around the services delivered by IT. So, you know, one of our big universities, Sam Houston State University, things that come from IT are all the at symbol and Sam. So something is, you've got the at Sam portal, which is their sharewell portal. Um, you've got the at Sam bulletin board. The uh, tweets that go out come from at Sam. Um, as they put communications out, uh, it's something that's changing in at Sam. Uh, and so it starts to tie things together and people start to associate things with that brand. Um, and that can be very effective in helping the communications to be a little more sticky or a little, little bit tighter. Um, we'll explore Tabitha in our next uh, uh, session, um, which Tabitha will be, I'm sure, scheduling with me 10 minutes after we're done here. Um, uh, pr probably in, in later September, we'll be doing another session and we'll dive into what are all of the elements that have to be managed as part of organizational change, dive a little bit deeper. Um, so hopefully you, you guys got were able to get a little um, idea of what's going on. Um, this, of course, uh, will be sent out to you from a recording perspective. We'll also get it up on our YouTube channel. And we hope to see you on either our Quest for Collaboration, which is actually starting right now um, at 3 p.m. Uh, uh, if you haven't been on our Quest for Collaboration calls, please join us. Um, you can register uh, from our website. Uh, on, on the resources page, there'll be the link to the Quest for Collaboration, or it's all over social media. Um, and join us for uh, our future webinars. We're doing a bunch on AI ops. Um, we have a knowledge management panel that's coming up, and we'll be doing some more on change management and KCS. Thank you all for joining us today, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, everyone.